Hey guys, this question asks, which of the following cannot theoretically be separated by a silica gel column chromatography? All right, so silica gel column chromatography, just as a recap, is you have a big, long glass column. Obviously, they make them in various sizes. You get sort of smaller, thinner ones, and you get these, you get really huge ones. And you basically fill it, there's usually a little bit of sand in the bottom, and then they fill it with this, they basically, basically take silica gel and they mix it with whatever solvent you're gonna use, and it makes this weird kind of slurry, it's like wet sand basically that goes in here. And then you add your compound, your, your reaction mixture at the top, and then you add more solvent. And then as the solvent, so then at the bottom here you have this little tap that you can open and then it starts to drip out. Okay, and usually you want to drip out nice and slowly so that everything moves nice and slowly through the column. And you have these little um, tubes at the bottom and then when the tube gets full, you move it over and then you put the next one and you number the tubes. And so then you can say, oh, okay, my compound came out of number two or a tube number three or tube number 16 or tube number 22. And so, um, and as things move, as the solvent moves down like this, it pulls your, your, your molecules in your mixture down with it, except Based on the polarity of the molecules, various molecules will move down at various speeds. Something that's extremely nonpolar, for example, like a benzene ring, um, that'll go down very fast. Whereas if you have a compound with a carboxylic acid, that'll stick to that silica gel molecules and it'll go down very slowly. It also obviously depends on what kind of solvent you use. There's there's a whole, like, it's, a, it's an extreme, you know, you could really teach a university class entirely just on column chromatography. It really is a fascinating uh, art. It's really just, I've seen some, uh, you know, postdocs in the laboratory where I was working that just, they were just so good at it. You know, they could just purify just about anything. And there's literally thousands of combinations of solvents that you can use. You know, you combine methanol in certain ratios to ethyl acetate or ethyl acetate and DCM and DCM and methanol. It's, it's really interesting. And, um, and so, but anyway, so you don't have to know all that for, for, for these exams, but um, it's good to just sort of understand and appreciate just how much detail there really is in this. Now, um, basically, simply put, the correct answer here is going to be B in antiomers. And the only thing this question was really trying to see is whether you remember that one little factoid about in antiomers, and that is that if two compounds are non-superimposable mirror images, right, so say you have this guy, uh, hydrogen, fluorine, bromine, and chlorine, okay, versus this compound, which is just the mirror image of it. If you take this compound, um, you'll see that the two of them, the only physical parameter where these two compounds are different is the direction in which they rotate plain polarized light. In other words, if you have a polarimeter and you shine light into this compound, it'll rotate the light, you know, it might be 30 degrees to the right for the one of them and 30 degrees to the other side. There's no way, and I, I just picked a hypothetical 30. It might be three degrees, might be 20 degrees, might be 105 degrees, okay? So, and all, all I can tell you is that it'll be the opposite for each compound, okay? So this 30 is not a solid number, it's just a hypothetical number, okay? Um, and there's no way to calculate that just by looking at the compounds. In fact, you can't even calculate which one's gonna be clockwise and which one's gonna be anti-clockwise. It'll literally, you can only figure that out by actually shining the light at it, okay? And that's a useful trick, because you can then use, you know, if you have a mixture of the two, and you shine and you know how they rotate play polarized light when they're pure, then you can kind of determine, you know, using sort of the weighted average, you know, calculation method, you can, you can determine what ratios of each, of each enantiomer do you have in your mixture based on how much, how the light is, is rotated by that mixture. So, but however, their melting point, the polarity, the boiling point, Everything else about this uh, about these two compounds are exactly the same. They will not be. Uh, they will not be. Uh, they cannot be separated by something like silica gel column chromatography. And they deliberately put in here silica gel column chromatography and not just column chromatography because actually there are some compounds, some some columns that have these specialized materials that are themselves chiral. It's, it's known as a chiral column. And basically what happens is with these, you know, the, the various compounds can, will interact with the chiral molecules in the column differently. Kind of the way that, you know, some 
One enantiomer of a compound may bind to an enzyme, but the other one can't because of just the orientation in which things point. It's a, it's the similar same idea, and as a result, that that you can do. But with silica gel column chromatography, just our regular columns, we cannot theoretically uh, separate enantiomers from from one another because their physical parameters are exactly the same. Um, constitutional isomers can very easily be separated. You know, think of something like uh, you can just use an ether versus an alcohol. These guys will have very different physical parameters. This guy can do hydrogen bonding, whereas this one cannot, so obviously they can. Diastereomers definitely can be. Um, that's usually, by, by the way, an option of, if you do have enantiomers, you can basically react them with another compound that has, uh, that has a stereo center and turn the enantiomer into a diastereomer compound, then separate the two diastereomers, and then finally, basically do the reverse reaction whereby you remove the, the part that you added to give you back your pure enantiomer. So the diastereomers definitely can be. Geometric isomers for sure, you know, think about like, it's basically cis strands, they all have different uh, physical properties. And the same, structural isomers is just another word for constitutional, so that's also out. So the def, def, correct answer here definitely is going to be B. Um, all right, I hope that made sense. This is a great question, make sure you understand exactly what's going on here. If you have any questions, shoot us an email, we'd be happy to respond. Thanks for watching this video, guys. We'll catch you in the next one. Have a nice day.